Welcome to Redefine the Circle, a podcast where we discuss all things pitching. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. In this podcast, we're going to highlight topics that focus on how to maximize your pitchers now. We're going to discuss some of the trends that we've seen at S2 Breakthrough and talk about how we use data to create systems and training approaches that are specific to each pitcher. It's so important for us to continue to share this information and facilitate discussion within the pitching community so we can keep evolving as coaches and ultimately grow pitching into something it's never been before. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for joining the quest to redefine the circle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefine the Circle. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development here at S2 Breakthrough, and I am so excited to be back here with Redefine the Circle. Uh, This podcast is something near and dear to my heart, and uh, for a while, obviously, we were cranking out episode after episode. Uh, We just had a couple other things that we were sort of shifting our attention to, and so there was a little bit of a hiatus with this uh, Redefine the Circle podcast, and so this is really the first episode where we're coming back, and uh, I really am excited. I obviously have had a lot of things on my mind about topics I wanted to discuss, and so I'm going to kick off today. So today's episode, I want to center around the topic topic of plyos, what they are, why we find them so important for pitchers, the ways in which we use them, um, and why I really just feel like they can completely revolutionize how pitchers train. So let's start with the question, what are plyos? So for those unfamiliar, plyos are rubber balls and they have sand in them. So they basically, uh, they are made for feel. So the same shape as a softball, the same size as a softball, The weights vary, and I'll get into that in just a bit of why and how we use them, but they are a tool made for feel as a pitcher is throwing a plyo. And really, even for someone, if we're not talking about pitching, of course, this podcast is called Redefine the Circle, so we're always talking about pitching, but if someone were to use them throwing overhand, it would be the same concept. The sand shakes, it moves around in the ball as the athlete is moving, and then there's much more feedback given to the brain regarding where the arm is in space. So It's a feedback tool. Again, same shape, same uh, size as a softball, just giving extra feedback to the brain. So what I always tell our pitchers is imagine any of the drills or any of the training strategies that we're doing with plyos, if you were just doing them on a softball, your brain would be getting a little less feedback. So that's how we think of them. What plyos are not? So we've had discussions where there is a lot of I don't know if maybe controversy is the word, but a little bit of controversy surrounding like weighted balls. And now I will say we do use weighted salt balls here at S2. That will be another topic. I'll kind of talk about a little bit of how we use them and why in today's episode, but that would be uh, another episode in and of itself. But the concept of weighted balls, sometimes there is literature that shows, you know, when using weighted balls and how poor that can be for arm health, especially when we're talking about throwing weighted softballs or usually the literature is around baseballs, throwing heavier or overload balls at high intensity for velocity, for the sake of arm strength. I want to just clear up right away. That is not what we are talking about. What we are actually talking about in the way in which we use plyos is all to promote things like efficiency, arm health, wellness. None of that applies because the protocols in which, one, they're not weighted balls. They are are plyos, which in and of itself is different, feel type of tools. But then also, again, the protocol in which things are actually applied is important. So if you are reading literature that exists out there, particularly in the baseball world, um, but things like using heavier balls or using weighted implements at high intensity for velo, that is not what we're talking about. And I want to really clear that up. Instead, again, we really take this concept of a, of a tool that's based around feel. Okay, so what that means is that Really, we use overload quite a bit. So the set that we use here at S2 Breakthrough is a a two-pounder, which we never throw. Usually we use that for some feedback in the glove arm. But what we're throwing would be something as heavy as a one-pound all the way down to a normal weight of a softball, which would be seven ounce. And then we sometimes even go under load, which is five ounce, which I can talk about. But most athletes were actually sitting in overload, like one pound to eight ounces. And the reason for 
that is because we are actually trying to slow things down. So now someone might be asking, why would you ever want to slow the motion down? Because the key to efficient patterns, the key to moving better in the motion is for the trunk and the arms to get in sync with one another, to get on time, to rotate well with one another. So that essentially the trunk or the body doesn't break down so much that then the arm is forced to take on the workload, take on the deceleration of this. This is really, really important. So I would absolutely, when we have young athletes, more unstable athletes, there's no doubt about it. They're going to start at lower intensities. I'll talk about the concept of intensity in just a bit, but lower intensities with overload because I want them to slow down and stop just trying to rip through with that arm and try to do everything with the arm. When we have poor patterns, which absolutely any athlete who doesn't have appropriate stability and the motion really requires a ton of stability. So the majority of athletes that we're working with in teenage years and below are going to fit in this category. They need to slow things down in order to promote arm health, to make sure they're getting a little bit more from the body and not just trying to do all of it from the arm. So with that said, it kind of makes you think, you know, one of the ways in which I'll get into this in detail, but we really work to build an environment around the plyos. Like, okay, the plyo is the feel tool. Then how do we make sure we build a training environment around that's really going to promote maximum level of efficiency for this athlete in centered around the training implement, the tool they're using, which is giving their brain a ton of feedback. So that's really how we do this. And so one of the key ways in which we really make sure plyo programs and plyo design is is really set up in a pitcher's training plan is to be their warm up. They start with plyos before going into throwing softballs. The reason for that is because when we're talking about designing an environment, what we're talking about is manipulating variables like intensity. So we usually always start off with about 50%, meaning get to about 50% distance, slow down your VLO and your intensity to about 50%, and then gradually work to about 75. I usually do not even really move unless we're doing something very specific for an athlete regarding VLO. Most plyo warmups stop at 75%. We're just gradually starting to build the body up. So we're talking about moving from very low intensity to about moderate low level of intensity. This in of itself is a fantastic strategy for warm up. If you think about how we've traditionally told pitchers to warm up, and maybe some of us still are, are things like so backward to how human movement works, so backward to how the body unravels and how it actually organizes. We take the body out of it. We might have them like standing with their feet still or on their knees or like eliminating the body's contribution. The body is the motion. Whether or not we can do something, really uh, we can be efficient in the motion, whether or not we get energy out to the arm or ultimately the ball, whether or not we can make the ball do anything special or different has to do with the body. We should really never eliminate that. And so certainly in warm up, we don't want to start a pitcher off with, okay, take out the body and now just get all of your acceleration going through the arm and then decelerate all of it through the arm. The body should be the main source of deceleration. So for us, when we go into plyos, our pitchers are going to start again, low to moderate intensity. And it starts from the full motion because we need the body fully involved in their patterns because that is what happens. And that's what we're trying to promote. Get the body and the arm to both understand their roles, get them both to understand how they're working together, how they're syncing together. That's the goal. This is a beautiful way for pitchers to warm up. So what we would do is, okay, they get through their plyo of 75. Now let's go 75% on a softball. Once we've done that, we'll move them to 100%. And then from there, they can start throwing all of their pitches. So plyos are the foundation for gradually building a pitcher through her warm up at appropriate speeds, appropriate progression of intensity, and making sure all along the way you are promoting pairing or sinking of the body and the arm. So if you're out there and you're listening to this and you're thinking, okay, my daughter, or maybe you're a coach, and you're like, I'm currently teaching this, starts with a warm up that isolates the arm. That could not be further from what we really want to start teaching our body to do. So interestingly, 
you know, we've had a couple of case studies where, um, and honestly, at this point, it's, it's, it's quite a few case studies that obviously allows us to know that this is something where our athletes who train at S2 on a regular basis, they always have their plyos. There have been circumstances where they have not had their plyos. Sometimes they'll go to high school and for whatever reason, their coaches don't like the idea of them using something that's unfamiliar to them. Sometimes they'll go to a tournament and there's no place to throw them or an umpire doesn't allow them to throw to a wall or for whatever reason, they say like, I didn't use my plyos. I forgot them. You know, uh, hopefully that's not what's going on, but sometimes it is. So, um, um, they'll say I had some soreness. I had excessive soreness and they don't link those two concepts. Usually they'll come, we have wellness questionnaires. They'll report excessive forearm tightness. I had some pain the next day. Like there was a spike in something and we'll ask, okay, first, did anything shift in workload? Was there like you pitched more than what you're prepared? No, no, no. We'll kind of get to the end of that. And then I'm like, okay, anything change about your warm up? Like, well, I didn't have my plyos. And so interestingly, what I've really come to see is that when pitchers who are used to building their body up gradually in intensity, and then also, again, the intensity is important, but it's also this concept of making sure the body and the arm are understanding how to sync with one another, one another, how to work with one another appropriately in the motion. When they eliminate that, oftentimes what they end up doing without realizing in their warm up is jumping way too high, like jumping into an intensity right off the bat that's way too high for them, way too aggressive, leading to a lot of forward movements in their chest, their arm is ripping through. And so the demands on the arm are just no go for them. And then obviously they're not used to that and their body is screaming like this was not right. You are recruiting from the wrong places. And I'm trying to desell energy. I shouldn't be. That's really the body signal to say that that was not an appropriate warm up. So that's one way that I think plyos are an absolute staple. They really control. They don't really allow, especially when we're starting with overload at low intensity, they force a slowdown. They force the gradual build in a warm up, which is so incredibly important. On top of that, you know, things like feet still doing an arm circle, we have got to stop doing things like that for our pitchers. It is so against what we now know about the motion. It's about the body's stability, posture, rotation, in order for the arm then to basically just stay on its own side, do its own work. We don't want the arm doing more work than that because that is what triggers things like pain, like poor performance, all of that. So we certainly don't want to warm up that way before a game. Okay, so warm-ups, that's a big piece. Let me talk a little bit more about this concept, like what is efficiency? What we would talk, how we talk about efficiency here at us, do breakthrough is basically how much the trunk contributes to the motion. So if trunk, we talk about stability for posture, for rotation. That level of, so that level of progression, if you will. So if someone has really poor stability, that absolutely the body, the trunk, pelvis to chest is not able to hold posture throughout the motion through both phases of it, the first turn, the second turn, posture splits, maybe chest is going in the air, maybe hips are driving back, maybe chest is collapsing forward, a variety of ways in which posture splits. So when posture really splits, they can't rotate well. And so basically the brain, the body, they're incredibly smart. They know how to accomplish the task. So they will use whatever's left. If the trunk is not doing it, then the arm. Sometimes we'll see the neck position. The levers will do the job for them, and that's a, a low level of efficiency. And so when we talk about helping athletes gain efficiency or build efficiency, what we're talking about is getting their trunk to contribute more to the motion. It's not about chasing some sort of optimal position or optimal patterns. It's about identifying their level of efficiency, their level of trunk contribution to the motion, and then working for it to contribute more than it currently does. That's what training really is about. And so let me revisit this concept of plyos and environment, environmental design. So we know we have this training modality. We have this tool that is all about giving the brain a ton of information. And so we will then manipulate other variables to really maximize. This is constraint-led training. It's changing variables so that basically the body, even though you are letting it unravel in its normal motion, you're basically guiding it to work a little bit better than it would if it had total freedom. That's constraint-led training. And we really design those environments around plyos because it's such a great field tool, because it's really made to give the brain information like this is how I should be moving. This is what I need the body to do. So some of those variables include things like changing intensity, as I've already talked about, 
the start type. So basically when I talk about start type, sometimes we have pitchers get into their weight shift and they pause. Sometimes we slowly have them go what I call tempo start. Sometimes we have them pause and then bounce through it. Basically in summary, all of the start types, they're all about manipulating control of the trunk during the load phase of the motion. The load phase is so important. This is probably a whole nother episode, but it's the only time that takeoff is the only time we have the ground until we land. And by the time we land, it's over, essentially. It's just time to decelerate. So this is the time where trunk control, tension, stability is really key if we're going to get the body to launch with appropriate speed and force, if we're going to get in good posture and drive rotation, all of these things that are important in the motion, it's a complex movement, of course, and that load is really where it starts. So the start types are just as they sound. They're our way of really helping the pitcher slow that down, feel that they're building a good load, feel that they're building tension in the appropriate parts of the body, and then taking off from there. And once they unravel, once they launch from a start type, it's just the full motion. And so for anyone that's just listening to this and this sounds unfamiliar, definitely, you know, looking at We have lots of information out there about pitchers throwing plyos and utilizing plyos. Um, I have a plyo module, a training module. So all of these will kind of walk you through a little bit more of a, like how, what exactly start types are and the details of them. Okay, so start types, intensity, and then the weight of the ball matter. So we will change the weight that we're throwing. And so this is kind of complicated. This is where I think this plyo module, this educational uh, module really would come in handy because it's really individualized. What weight should that pitcher be throwing? You know, should she get, should she stay in overload? Is she able to maintain overload at at higher intensities or moderate intensities? Like I should say at 75%. Should she ever throw a seven ounce? You know, that all depends on her timing with her arm and her trunk. So there's a high level of individuality with that. But basically we also change the weight to keep basically getting her body and her arm to negotiate where they are in space and how to sync up and work together, as I mentioned. This is how we attack patterns. For us, there is no such thing as a pitcher not being able to change patterns. The body is so, it it, it knows how to, to work. It wants to work smarter. And so when you give it the appropriate environments, of course, we're talking about making sure We're taking into account movement and strength and conditioning. But when I'm talking about pitching, when we just simply give pitchers plyos and we give them the right environment, we change the right variables, and we ask their bodies to just unravel and self-organize, almost immediately we can see some sort of change. Now, when we're looking for more extensive change, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but we, the body absolutely, it wants to organize in the most efficient way. And so oftentimes we see that pitchers don't make pattern changes because we're attacking training in all the wrong ways. Maybe we are only asking them to make change at high intensity. That's a big deal. Pattern changes happen at low intensity. This is when the brain registers feel. This is how basically posture is managed at best. Very few athletes show us in our assessment here that they have trunk control at really high intensities. And the motion is the most complex movement in the game. There is no doubt about it. And so When we're asking them in the moment while airborne with their arm overhead to make change, that's not happening. We're basically just asking them to have an intent, but it's not outside of intent. It's not actually driving the brain to communicate to the body differently and really seeking something different. We're talking about motor learning, getting the body to tap into different ways of movement, different concept, another, certainly another episode, but low intensity, what we have found is where pattern changes happen. And then we gradually build them to high intensity. So for us, We are not only using plyos as a way to make sure pitchers are warming up appropriately, we're also there at the heart of a pitcher's program. This is where our ability to get them to move in a more efficient manner, to improve their patterns, this is where it lies. It starts with plyos at low intensity, manipulating all of those variables, as I said, in ways that are really specific and unique to that pitcher. Okay, the the third thing that I really want to talk about is variability. At the end of the day, what we are going for is we want the trunk to have the most stability so that the arm can have maximum variability. So when I mean variability, I mean anything from being able to adjust timing of a zone, uh, height, lanes, all the way to manipulating hand position to create different spins and break on the ball. We want the arm to have a lot of variability, but in order to do that, the trunk has to have stability. So if there's a lot of variability in the trunk, 
any pitcher who is young into mid teenage years hasn't reached puberty yet like there there is no such thing as stability in the trunk and so what they're going to do likely is seek that stability in their levers it's going to stiffen up and variability on the ball goes down that is just the nature of the beast which is why we have to be really patient with athletes until they get to a point where their body is stable obviously training then comes into place to feed that stability at high intensity um and so that's the goal Stability in the middle, stability in the body, variability in the arm. So a way, another way in which we would use plyos is to start to introduce. So we have thresholds. Once we see a level of trunk stability in an athlete's assessment at X point, then we know she can handle variability in weight with plyos. And so we start changing the weights as she's throwing. So we'll say, okay, on this next pitch, you're going to do all tempo starts or all bounce starts, and you're going to throw you know, a one, an eight, a seven, maybe even a five, maybe a little bit of underload just for the sake of variability. And you, this is about a task. No matter what, regardless of where your trunk is, regardless of the efficiency of your patterns, you are going to hit that same spot on the wall. You have to teach your arm that you have adjustability, you have variability. So even if trunk is a little forward, even if posture is not where it needs to be, your arm is not stuck in only being able to do one thing. This is a foundational concept that needs to happen for pitchers. The game is all about adjustability. So we have efficiency on one hand. It's like the more efficient you are, the more variability you get in the arm. But at the end of the day, even if efficiency is low, you still need a variability and adjustability because that is what the game requires. So I think that you know, oftentimes our pitchers will come to me and say, I literally, I was at live at high school practice, or we got to the game late, the bus got lost, whatever that is, or the umpire rushed us. I had five minutes to get ready. And I always say to them, go right to plyo variability, do a couple at low intensity, get right back to moderate intensity and get plyo variability. Tell the body right away, whatever I have, I have, and my arm has to be able to adjust. There's adjustability there. I'm not stuck in only doing one thing. Changing weights, what I just call plyo variability, changing weights frequently and it being about a task, really being focused on making sure they hit a task. So if they threw the one, it can't go into the ground. It's got to be able, they have to adjust the timing. Basically, what I'm asking them to do is understand this concept of segmentation in their arm. The arm is not stiff. It's not a single unit. The upper arm and the lower arm have some fluidity to them. They can segment, they can adjust. And so making sure the one hits the target by the time you get to a seven or maybe an overload, you can't just throw it to the ceiling. You need to be able to then unravel that arm action earlier or sooner to be able to hit the same target. So in games, we see a ton of variability in environment, in body. So a fatigue maybe makes patterns break down footing, the field conditions are poor. There's a hole. The hole gets inc increasingly more difficult for a pitcher to manage as the game goes on. So all of that is going to adjust where their body is. So if the arm only knows one thing and can only really do one thing, then as soon as those things happen, the hole gets too large for the pitcher to manage, uh, you know, they get a little fatigued, then they're out of the game because they lose the ability to maybe spin the ball in different directions or to make adjustments in command. And so we can't have that, right? I mean, we can't, but we don't want to have that as pitchers, as coaches. So then this is really where this concept of training adjustability. I always make a joke, but anytime someone yells, make an adjustment, I always say to our pitchers, like, what does that even mean, right? But what we never train our pitchers for adjustability. Plyo variability, in my mind, is the absolute best way for us to be able to do that. On top of that, in addition to it, to the plyo variability being a great like in-game preparation tool, adjustability concept, for us at S2, it serves as the foundation for being able to then throw weighted softballs. So when I said adjusting, you know, having a, a task that you're focused on and adjusting weights is about just understanding how to segment the arm, making sure it's not just unraveling stiff and as a single unit, but you have some whip action in that unraveling process. The next part for us would be when we're really working on pitch development, changing spin direction for a particular pitch for an athlete, we want to move to weighted softballs. And so then we're talking about not just upper arm versus lower arm, but manipulating hand position. So we first, oh, we, we have criteria that says this pitcher qualifies for the level of trunk stability needed for plyo variability. Then there's an increased level of trunk stability needed where we then move it into now she's going to be able to actually feel she's a enough stability where she can feel what's happening at the hand. And now we can start manipulating. So 
you know, a lot of times this is important. Pitchers will come like, I want new pitches. I want more pitches. I'm like, you are not stable enough to even qualify for throwing weighted plyos. The foundation of learning new pitches is using weighted softballs here at S2 because we know learning new pitches isn't just about angling the same spin direction. We're talking about manipulating the hand in a different way. That requires a lot of stability for your brain to register all the way down to what's going on with the hand. So this is a very clear way for us to gradually build into that and for pitchers to see what is required of my level of stability in the body for me to be able to manipulate the hand and to be able to have that level of variability. So all of these things, I can't say enough how much plyo is like, you know, we often say they're a staple in S2 training. Like, they're not even the staple. They're the soul. They are the heart of what we do for pitchers here because of this concept of, of the way they, they are so critical for warm-ups, for building, for changing patterns, building efficiency, for teaching variability. They, all of the major concepts that we are really trying to drive home in pitching, they're at the heart when it comes to how we're actually training our athletes to be able to really do those, you know, handle those concepts or do those things better. So I call them magic. I've like, maybe I don't believe in magic. Like, oh, I'm going to go see this pitching coach or I'm going to walk into this clinic and it's magic. Now I'm perfect as a pitcher. We have to be careful with thinking of like quick fixes, but I often call plyos magic because of just how powerful they are, how much we are, have been able to see pitchers change because of them, how much they promote efficiency and arm health and overall body health. Honestly, it's not just uh, the plyo themselves, but again, the environment we build around them, but they're just such an incredible tool. So going back to the concept that I talked about earlier about weighted balls and then being bad for arm health, again, that couldn't be further from the way in which we use plyos, which are the exact opposite. They are all about promoting health for the pitcher. So, you know, there are times where we might be kind of pushing boundaries a little bit with saying like, okay, this training strategy is a little risky. Maybe we're chasing velo with a very stable athlete, but we're really closely monitoring arm health. No doubt about it. There are times at S2 where we're pushing up against, we say like we're putting our feet up against the fire a little bit because we're really going. It's an older athlete, a college athlete, whatever that might be. Plyos are not that. They are not risky. And maybe, of course, you want to know what weights to deploy and how, which is why I think that plyo module would be so helpful for so many coaches or parents out there looking to make sure their, their daughters or, or athletes have an appropriate plyo program, which is ever evolving, of course. But, um, you know, of course, there's always ways to make sure that we are we are creating an appropriate program and and uh, manipulating variables in a way that match that athlete. But overall, this is not one of those training strategies where it's like, okay, this is this could potentially push things or we could have some soreness. This is all about promoting good patterns, good stability, arm health. And so, like I said, I just, they are an absolute must. And so the concept of plyos, I do think we see them a little bit more in overhand throwing. People are more comfortable, but sometimes there's this pushback with how to use them and what they're for in pitching. And because I know at this point, we have used them for so many years, documented so many different ways in which we use them, obviously have attached wellness data and arm health data. And I feel so confident that there's such an incredible tool. And in my mind, an absolute critical tool. If you want to progress and make change, they are a must have for pitchers. That is how confident I feel. So I wanted to really be able to express that, be able to make sure I break down all of the ways in which we use plyos and why and why we really put them at the center of our training. If you are looking for more information, obviously you can contact us directly, but also there's so many things that we have from a social media standpoint. Again, this module that that uh, is really educational in walking people through how to, what to look at in a pitcher's patterns and their video and be able to make sure you're building the right plyo program for them. But I cannot say enough, plyos are a must. I really hope we start expanding how we think about training pitchers and how to make them better. Because in my mind, once we really understand how pitchers can get better, then this tool, absolute no-brainer. It's already a no-brainer. Like I said, I wouldn't call it a staple. It's the soul of S2. So soul of S2 as far as training strategies and modalities. So um, 
That was great. I'm so happy that we, uh, I'm finally back here for Redefine the Circle. It's so fun to, to get back here uh, and talk about concepts that are just near and dear to my heart and to all of us at S2, the types of things that we work with on our athletes on a daily basis. Hopefully you found some of that information helpful. Like I said, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out uh, directly. Uh, looking forward to getting on more of a regular schedule with Redefine the Circle. Thank you so much for joining today. Between now and the next episode, don't forget to keep questing on to redefine the circle. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I'd love to connect and hear your feedback. You can contact me directly at ashley at s2breakthrough.com. If you're listening, you can leave us a review. Or if you're watching, go ahead and leave a comment below. Also, be sure to follow S2 Breakthrough on all of our social media channels and subscribe to Stream S2 to find all things player development. Until next time, quest on.